everyone. Welcome to today's WCT webinar, Navigating the OPM Marketplace, Picking the Right Partners While Avoiding Market Chaos. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCEP. As we go through the conversation today, feel free to add your questions to the question box and comments to the comment box. I anticipate that we'll have a lot of questions today. We hope to get to most of those. If we don't, I'll pull those out and share them with Phil and then we'll do a follow-up blog post. We'll be sharing the link to the PowerPoint slides so you can follow along with us. And we'll also follow up with any additional resources that were shared and a link to the recording, which will include captions. If you'd like to follow along, we typically have a pretty active Twitter discussion and the hashtag is WCET webcast. Today, we'll go through brief introductions background and overview on the OPM marketplace and services, the current landscape, then we'll get to a moderated Q&A as well as audience Q&A and conclusion. Hopefully we'll wrap up within 60 minutes. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. We typically hold all questions till the end of the presentation, but feel free to enter your questions and then if I need to interject and ask Phil, I certainly will. So keep those questions coming throughout. Again, I'm Megan Raymond. I'll also be your moderator today. And our speaker today is Phil Hill with MindWire, MindWire's Consulting. So Phil is notorious for being an ed tech consultant, speaker, blogger, and market analyst. He's analyzed the growth of technology and enabled change for educational institutions for many, many years. And his clients have included WGU, California Community College System, Iowa State University, and Pearson Education, and many others. So, so I'm gonna ask you to do a brief self-introduction, but I wanna lead with a question that may illuminate a little bit of your past. But if you weren't D, Phil on EdTech, what would your previous or other occupation be? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Uh, I'll call myself the, the notorious Phil from now on. Thank you for that. Um, if, if I weren't, well, what I was doing before ed tech is I was working in a field with, it was engineering. I have an engineer background and I was dealing with uh, real-time image processing systems. So I don't know that I could have stuck with that long-term because I'm just too drawn towards education. So if I weren't in this position, I'd be finding some place of chaos to be involved, leading some project or getting in trouble somewhere. So it's a hard question to answer. I really thought that you were going to answer with a rock star, but that's a great answer. Yeah, but, but I'm well aware of my uh, limitations on skills with the base, so. <laughs> do what you're good at. I'll go ahead and yeah. pass it off to you, Phil. Sure, and just for uh, additional context so that people understand, you know, sort of my point of view and where I'm coming from, uh, is uh, MindWires Consulting, we help organizations that are dealing with technology-enabled change directly tied to teaching and learning. So please don't ask any ERP questions in the background. We're not dealing with that. And we try to be neutral uh, market observers and really trying to help organizations make uh, good decisions. So we try not to come across like we favor this technology or we're vendor neutral is one way to look at it, but we try to help explain things. And it seems to me that what we've chosen is we said, hey, we need to have a topic today that's less contentious than the congressional whistleblower testimony today, but only slightly less contentious. And the field of online program management lately has been incredibly contentious, and there's a lot of noise that's happening. So there's a lot going on. So online program management, I think it's important to try to say, can we understand the substance and see if we can cut through some of the noise, specifically so that schools and organizations can make better decisions about what they should be doing next. Uh, since it's a field that's not very well defined, I do want to call out what we mean by that or, you know, the way I'm describing it. Um, the set of services around a company that's helping a school either create or deliver an online program. Uh, the way I've seen it categorized that's most useful is you have marketing and recruiting and market research efforts um, that, that they're providing for a school, but not the actual admissions that's uh, typically handled by the school itself. 
you do have, and unfortunately, the marketing and recruitment and market research has been sort of at the core of this market. Um, and it's also been a source of some of the, a uh, lot of pushback we've seen lately. I'm hoping over time, and I believe we're seeing a shift more towards course and curriculum design as being a key element in OPM services. How do you do effective, engaging design of courses and curriculum? There's also student support services, call center, help desk, retention, degree pathways, various support. Um, now that's student, but it's also support for faculty. And then finally, technology infrastructure and analytics. Uh, this industry actually came out of a place where the, in, the LMS provision was a key part of what it provided, hosting of an LMS. These days, in most cases, you have an LMS agnostic view and quite often using the university's LMS, but still the overall integration of systems and using data and analytics to inform it. So these four broad categories are what we tend to see with um, as an OPM set of services. So I think it'd be good to, we can't capture all the history, but just say, what does the landscape look like today? If you just had to say, where is the market today and how do we understand it? We have this next chart to try to uh, give a better view of that. So with this chart, and I'm having to put on my glasses to be able to see it as well, um, we're trying to call out, uh, this is not meant to be comprehensive, listing every vendor that does everything. We're trying to give a landscape so that people can understand the high level of what's happening. And the traditional um, market has been known by the top portion. So on the left, you have a business model. Um, you know, tuition revenue share is the revenue model down to fee for service on the bottom, but also hybrid in between. And we'll discuss that a little bit more depth. If you look at what the outcome is, we have that broadly grouped into degrees, both undergrad degrees and grad degrees. And as you can see from the landscape, the core of the market has been in the grad degrees, particularly. Um, particularly the master's level. But there's also growing emphasis on non-degree work, certificate work, and it's even blending over into professional corporate training or job entry type of skills. So this landscape tries to capture where we are. The top rectangle, um, these are the large customer base uh, full service OPMs. It's what people tend to identify with the market. You have Pearson, um, which had acquired Embanet, plus they had their own operation. And so Pearson has a large OPM business. Um, 2U has long had their grad degree programs, but they've also acquired Trilogy and Get Smarter to broaden out what they do. And they have a partnership with KeyPath as well separate company, but they have an investment in them and they have a coordination. Wiley, which had acquired Deltac and has more recently acquired Learning House, academic partnerships, and BISC education. And these are sort of the biggest, uh, biggest, longest term OPM vendors that people identify with the market. They tend to be tuition revenue share. They tend to be full service. But there are other elements of the market because the market's changing. It's no longer just one thing. So as you sort of go down, you do have smaller customer base that still might be uh, tuition revenue share and full service. And we have several listed here, you know, certainly Hot Chalk, Everspring, iLaw has uh, gotten, you know, I've seen a lot of activity from them lately, um, Helix, All Campus. So there's a series of um, OPMs but they, they tend to be, uh, they're categorized a little bit lower just in terms of the size of their customer base. But when we have two new areas that have really come on lately, one is the MOOC providers, um, so I'm skipping one. The MOOC providers uh, really got into this market with Udacity and the Georgia Tech Masters of Computer Science deal, and they've uh, scaled that out. But more recently, Coursera has gotten in. As a matter of fact, the main business of, uh, of several of the MOOC providers is really as OPM providers. 
partnerships with schools, dealing with revenue share, developing online programs. Um, and this is a model that the promise of it is, hey, we can enable lower cost degrees because we have to do less recruiting because we have the MOOC large registered base. That's the promise of the market. And then finally, the most recent addition is really what you would call, you could call the for-profit conversions. So you could think of this as, uh, this is a little bit interesting, Orbis was acquired by Grand Canyon as sort of an OPM arm, and Grand Canyon spun off their university into a nonprofit, but essentially a former for-profit is now operating an OPM. Same thing with Kaplan in terms of the Purdue Global and uh, other deals that they're doing. So there are different flavors of OPM. But down at the bottom, you're getting into, and this is where a lot of the growth is and a lot of the change in the market is coming for really what are fee-for-service partners. Noodle Partners uh, does can do full service or they can do a la carte, but they really have emphasized the fee-for-service. I designed extension engine, even the LMS providers, um, Blackboard and D2L, do a lot of the OPM. Again, this is the part where I do not want to imply that it's a comprehensive listing, but I wanted to give a sample to show you how much the OPM market has actually been changing and the different flavors that are coming on. Because there's a lot of the narrative that the market is moving from point A to point B, whereas we see it much more as it's expanding in options and varieties and models, and it's getting hard to categorize. But uh, so I want to jump into a little bit more detail on some of these key points uh, to help understand that. So with the first one, um, go ahead and do the first one. This is the first time I've actually tried using the PowerPoint Zoom feature, so we're going to see how that goes. If you look at the market origins, it's, I think it's important to understand the OPM market really began in the 1990s. This is not a new phenomenon. It, it might have grown recently, and it certainly is in the news quite a bit more, but the origins are in the 1990s. In BISC education, for example, less Regis University and their online MBA from the mid-1990s. DELTAC, which went on and went through several changes, but got acquired by uh, Wiley, they, they were founded in 1997. So the origins of the market really go all the way back to the 1990s. And one way you could look at this is this is at the same time that online education on its own was growing. And you had sort of different models that were expanding. You had the for-profit sector, the University of Phoenix, uh, DeVry, you know, the, the various for-profit schools, they were rapidly growing their online programs themselves and designing the programs and their online operations directly starting back in the 1990s. But you also had a series of non, uh, mostly nonprofit schools that began their online operations also back in the late 90s or early 2000s. And so this would get into a lot of where people, uh, the Sloan Consortium uh, schools or set of schools, it was an important subset. And so when you had Penn State World Campus, you had UM, University of Maryland University Campus, so UMUC, you had various nonprofit schools who really began their online offer offerings back then. And they, it took a long time that they developed everything they needed to do to run these online programs. In parallel with these, there was a market need that said, hey, what about schools who aren't for-profit? They haven't been long-term, you know, starting back in the 90s. They didn't perceive that they had the capabilities to do this on their own. How do they develop online programs? That's where the OPM market started, was saying, how do these non-profit schools who are not the long-term schools that have been investing in brand new operations. How does a traditional school develop an online program? And that's where a lot of this came, came about. And, you know, there were a lot of changes that happened in the 2000s. And I threw up some of the examples, such as Deltac and Collegius, and then they separated and got acquired. So it's a confusing world. 
but there was a lot of activities going on in the 90s and particularly in the 2000s. And then where you had Embinet and Compass merged in 2010, really created a much larger force. Um, and you started getting more and more of this momentum building up at this time. But the market really started much earlier than people seem to imply. Quite a lot of the news media makes you feel like, hey, this is a new phenomenon that started back in 2010 or 2012, and it's something brand new hitting education. And there's really a lot more to it since then. And I think it's important to understand that history um, to, to be able to understand what might happen moving into the future. All right, so if we zoom back out, uh, another area that's worth doing is understanding a little bit more detail because there are different models, how do we actually define these? So let's look at the, the next zoom in. There is not a commonly accepted definition of these terms, um, but certainly my suggestion uh, and the way I'm trying to use it within this webinar and a lot of the blog posts, you have online program management, and that tends to be the subset that they are the primary partner to enable a higher education institution to create and or deliver online. The primary partner is really a key point. We're not trying to say every vendor that is helping a school as they go online. We're really looking at it where a school says, we need help going online. Here's how we're doing it. We're working with these guys to, to make this happen. So OPM is a primary a partner and they tend to do full service. So the full set of categories that I mentioned earlier of services all bundled together and typically has been tuition revenue sharing is the business model. That's historically been where it's at. There's been a new category that I would describe, and I've seen different ways that it's described, but online program enablement, OPE. And this, again, I'm trying to define this as primary partner still. So it's still the main company who might be helping the school do this, but it's broader in context than just OPM because you're getting into, for example, in red highlighted some of the differences. You're getting into, well, maybe it's not just an online program, maybe a program, a mix of face-to-face -face and online and uh, experiential programs. And this is also important because as you start getting into boot camp type of offerings. <clears throat> the other difference is for OPE that I see uh, more broadly, that's typically a significant subset of the services that I mentioned earlier, but not necessarily a full service company. It's somebody who says, hey, we do, we are the primary partner, but we don't do course design. Or we're the primary partner, but we don't do recruitment, you know, but we help in all the other ways. So OPE, the way I'm um, using this, is, is this broader case that we're getting into. It's not just one thing that's tuition revenue sharing, that's full service bundled, and, and working that way. It's much broader and it includes hybrid. Now, there are other categories which I don't consider OPM or OPE. I only mention them here to acknowledge there's a lot of important companies who are helping schools go online, learning management system, courseware, other types of educational technology, services company who do development and integration. These are all important, but I'm not saying those are the same as OPM or OPE. So for definitions to at least try to have a common language, that's how I'm using it. All right, if we zoom back out, uh, I do want to highlight another point because this is, uh, you know, key to the definition. So if you look at this unbundled view, it goes beyond just the four categories I listed. There's an excellent report that was done from the University of Cape Town that looked at uh, unbundled university and uh, University of Leeds, University of Cape Town, I have a link. I highly recommend people get that full report because there's some really valuable descriptions in there. In this case, they called out a lot of the services in much more detail that might be out there. And it's a great map 
It's a map that's useful for schools who are trying to do vendor selection. It's a good map to check to say, hey, what do we do? What do we want the company to provide? So I just find this to be a very useful map. And I do recommend this report uh, as a good way to get this. All right, so if we zoom back out. And then the final one is let's get into start transitioning to what becomes contentious. Um, the, this, by the way, also comes from the exact same report. Uh, so I will reiterate the strong recommendation that it's a great resource for you. All right, so this thing, it's a good description of, you know, uh, the various things. You can have, we'll start from the right, full service partnership. That's a lot of the traditional definition of OPM, a private company invest in university online education in return for a profit share. That nuance is important. We're not just talking the basis of this uh, revenue sharing model and the funding model is not just we take a percentage. There's an investment that's happening. A lot of it might not be the same amount that it was in past years, but it can cost millions of dollars for a company to invest and start up an online program that's uh, set up to scale. And so a question for us, who is actually funding that investment that happens before you get the tuition that can back up the payments? In the full service uh, model, it's the company, the OPM provider, who's doing that investment at their risk, and then in exchange for a tuition revenue share, a profit share. Um, so naturally, the model does focus on marketable online courses and programs. There's got to be some potential payoff for this model to make sense. Um, if you skip over to the left, in-house provision, we mentioned that there's uh, quite a few schools who have done this work themselves. So for example, uh, one, the largest, fastest growing school, Southern New Hampshire University, they have designed their operations to be their own service provider. They do this in-house. It's in-house production and delivery. They build up their own capability. Um, but I mentioned Penn State World Campus. You know, there are quite a few nonprofit schools that have invested real money in their uh, infrastructure, their operations, their capabilities to be able to do online programs but particularly online programs that can scale beyond just a few dozen students within the program. Now, in the middle, we've always had individual ed tech companies, but in the middle at the OPM or OPE level, this is the newer category that's changing things. These are people who are saying, hey, we'll be your partner to do this online program, but we'll do it on a fee-for-service basis. You, the school, need to pay directly for marketing uh, you, you know, and it's more of a standard contractual model. Um, and you pick and mix which services you want. So it tends to not be full service. It's more of a which ones do I want? The ones that I'm providing in-house as a school, I obviously am not going to pay for. These are the common funding models. But as we're going to get into a little bit later, it's important to understand these are not just three individual choices. Fee-for-service and full-service are not binary choices. There's a hybrid and a real mix in between, and we'll get into that. Okay, uh, so let's zoom back out, but I did want to take a chance in case there are any questions, Megan, that were worth uh, addressing ahead of time before we get into some of the more chaotic aspects of the market. Yeah, you bet. So let me just scroll over to the Q&A. Um, Kelvin, our friend Kelvin Bentley had a question. Given many schools use OPMs and two use recent drop in stock price, is this the reflection the market is too crowded, competing for a limited amount of students? Well, two things. First of all, not surprised Kelvin has the first question. <laughs> but uh, second thing is, yeah, that's, that's a great segue into the section we're going into. It is a crowded market. Um, in two different ways, not just among OPM vendors, but among schools. So absolutely, it's a crowded market, but I do want to treat that more as a segue into the next section. So I'll answer more fully as we get into the next section. Okay, so in this actually, so it's a great setup. Thank you, Kelvin, for um, prompt, prompting us to go this direction. You certainly will read a lot about that this is a growing market. 
Um, the OPM is growing, and it is. Um, and there's uh, companies who are making a lot of money off of this, and online education is growing. And there's sort of a narrative that gets thrown out there that, hey, everything's growing and everything's easy. But there are two key things to try to um, understand with this market is, first of all, it's crowded, as uh, Kelvin had pointed out. It's not easy, but it's also expensive. So go back to the comment about companies who are investing millions in a standing up a program and the expectation that they're going to make money three, four, five years down the road. It'll pay off later. That makes it an expensive proposition. And as online education has grown, that's gotten even more difficult. So this is a very difficult and crowded market, and it's an expensive market. If you're a company that's playing in here, you have to be careful to pick your right model and your right niche. Otherwise, you're going to bite off more than you can chew, and there's a lot of things happening. So the picture I have, as you can see, I almost view the market like a scene from Mad Max. Yes, it's growing, but boy, it's really chaotic and dangerous. And so one way to look at this is everybody, there's a lot of things going out there. A lot of the business driver of the market is the fuel truck of college online program revenue. And you have a lot of uh, barriers and uh, little disasters that have happened uh, throughout, the, throughout the process. I'll mention uh, one, so Eastern Michigan faculty had a uh, big protest about an OPM relationship at their school and that changed what was happening. Uh, there was a case where um, Synergy, uh, Synergist was going to be servicing a program at USC and that fell apart at the last minute. Uh, just last year, uh, or maybe I've lost a year, Greenwood Hall basically imploded. They shut down the call center and the company, they had just built a new call center and shut it down almost with no notice, right before Christmas. Um, you have DeVry, uh, they had an OPM that they were trying to spin up uh, called IES. They essentially left the market. Um, and then I mentioned the uh, University of Florida Online. That one started out as an OPM-based deal and it did not work. It, and so that's a case I need to, you see that it hit some rocks, but then you see this new one that went past the rocks and didn't quite get the graphic right there. UF Online has redefined itself to do this in-house and they've changed their, but core to that is they've changed their expectations on student enrollments and how they can fund it. So they had a huge wreck, if you will, but they also, they very honestly understood what was happening, changed their model, changed their expectation, and it's a very successful program now. But the OPM basis of it is what I'm representing as a crash that happened. 2U, which has really been the face of the market, um, for a long time they were positioned as sort of the car that was way on the outside. They had a niche market, and they stopped and they avoided a lot of this chaos. So their business model, because they went after elite institutions that other companies weren't going after, and they had a model that worked there, and they could work on their own. They had a small bump with Semester Online where they tried to do undergraduate as a consortium approach. That fell apart, but they kept going on. More recently, however, and Kelvin alluded to this, uh, they had a large change in the market perception of them with their, uh, with their announcements on July 30th. And I have a blog post to help us, helps explain this. But their stock price really crashed. And a lot of that was based on, as they explained it, the market has changed, not just the OPM market and competition between companies, but more importantly, it's getting to be a crowded space between institutions who are trying to do online programs. So a lot of this competition is competition for students between the schools. That has changed the operating, the model and the assumptions financially behind 2U, and it's part of the reason they've really broadened out. They're now, I mean, they've done the acquisitions with Trilogy and Get Smarter, but they're also now offering fee-for-service as part of their um, a new partnership program 
four schools that are already using them as a traditional OPM. So I don't want to harp on it too much other than the fact that here's a company that really has been the face of the OPM market. And for a long time, they've been sort of outside the fray of all this chaotic market dynamics. But even they're getting caught up in it now. And it's a reflection on how chaotic it is, but also how crowded it is and how much competition for students are out there. So long-winded way, I do want to point one other point here because it will get into some others is it's a chaotic Mad Max type market. And if you hadn't seen the original Mad Max, I also endorse watching that. Um, what I would like to say is California AB 1345 and the pushback on the long-term revenue share contracts. What that's getting called out is there is a active move with policymakers, regulators, state lawmakers, particularly in California, who are trying to rein in or change how the OPM market works, and in particular, the revenue sharing aspect of it. And so far, you know, it's causing some changes, but there's a lot of noise behind it. And these are barriers. These are things that people need to be aware of there. We're going to continue having a chaotic market even moving forward. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but I, this really is hopefully a setup to talk about growing market, a lot of opportunity, important market for non-traditional students in particular, but it's very chaotic. So let's uh, jump in on a couple of the specific elements that we're referring to here. Um, go ahead with the first zoom in. I love that feature now. Okay, so continuing this uh, talk about the pushback against the OPMs. It would be a mistake to look a lot of the things that are happening, um, such as the article in the Huffington Post uh, that's in the top right about the creeping capitalist takeover and the uh, and then the Century Foundation report that came out recently really talking about for-profit middlemen OPM driving up the cost of online higher education. And an unintended consequence of that is because of a lot of the legislation happening in California in this area, that's what led to this summer where if people recall there was a case where all of a sudden California residents who were taking classes at out of state nonprofit schools were sudden uh, nonprofit online schools were no longer eligible for federal financial aid. So there was a real kerfuffle that happened in July. It got resolved, but that's part of this whole coordinated pushback. So there's a lot of questions saying, hey, about this market, are schools selling their future to get these online programs? Are they giving away revenue and preventing themselves from building up internal capabilities moving forward? And are corporate profits taking priority over students? That's sort of the question that's being addressed and that has really led to a strong and vocal pushback against that aspect of the market. Now there's counter pushback and I've been part of that, I'll be honest. So in the bottom left, I'm pointing out that when the Century Foundation came out with their report, it was very much a position paper, but it was masquerading that it was a research study where you actually research, see what happens, and then make conclusions. They had their conclusions ahead of time. So it's leading, there's a lot of pushback going on, but there's also a lot of shoddy analysis and shoddy media coverage based on it. And uh, certainly our perspective is it's not helping the matter for people to understand what's really happening with OPM companies, should they work with them, what's the right model for them. But there's a lot of noise and a lot of pushback. It's probably the most common question that you get, hey, is this going to, is this new pushback, does this mean tuition revenue share OPM model is dead? That's probably one of the most common questions that I get. From our perspective of what we see, no, we don't see it as that model's going away. We see new models coming on board. So schools have more options, there is more chaos, but so far we have not seen any indications that the revenue share full service model will disappear. I, um, but it's an open question. I gotta acknowledge that there are some legitimate 
parts that need to be addressed. Is it, you know, if you take individual deals, are they good deals? And let's be honest, there are a lot of awful contracts out there. Um, and some of the what's awful is just there's a they're very shallow. Uh, we the market grew up where so much of the activity happened. It wasn't coordinated. There wasn't strong negotiating on the terms and how you exit conditions that you need to change partners. Or um, and so there are there is a problem with some contracts that really are unfair financially. There are some contracts that are just ill-defined and problematic for a school. So there, and then there's also a very legitimate question about the cost of education for students and how do you lower costs for students? So there are legitimate, I don't want to imply that there are no legitimate questions, there absolutely are, but there's also a lot of noise that's coming from this pushback that I believe is problematic. But it's out there, so I want to address that, and you know the, that's a major part of the chaos we're seeing right now. All right, so if we zoom back out, I want to make sure we leave ourselves time for questions on that as well. Uh, let's go to the next one. This gets to the false binary. There's a, one of the biggest problems, and even understanding however you stand, if you agree that revenue sharing is not the way to go or you think it is the way to go, um, it's getting presented too much as a false dilemma. You know, do you want clean air or clean water? You can't have both. Well, the reality of the matter is there's a lot of hybrid options out there. This does not need to be one or the other, you can't, it's a tuition revenue share versus a fee for service. That's a false argument that's confusing matters. And just, um, and my, another case I would like to point out in the Newman Seinfeld world, I won't say who's who, there's a lot of back and forth that is harmful to the discussion between two companies. Um, but Noodle Partners, they're the ones advocating fee for service, but they offer a form of revenue sharing. Now, they will argue and say, hey, this is short term, it's, it's transparent, it's, uh, and then once you pay it back, you move to fee for service. So it's a different form, but they offer revenue sharing. They, uh, there's a percentage of tuition that you can get into a model with them where that's how they're getting paid as part of the, part of the thing. Likewise, to you, who's been the face of the OPM market, they are no longer just based on tuition revenue sharing. They are actually branching into fee-for-service. So the two poster children for fee-for-service and revenue sharing, they're offering hybrid models, and that is consistent. There are quite a few companies who will offer a mix of revenue sharing and fee-for-service. So what's important is not to view one versus the other. View it as more of a spectrum or a set of options that schools need to figure out what's the appropriate model. And quite often it's what's the appropriate model for this online program. You might have a different answer for an online business degree than you would with an online humanities degree. And you do see a lot of schools who have different OPM or non-OPM programs within the same school. But the key point here is it's a false dynamic to say it's one versus the other. It is some important questions, but it's not an A versus B question that's going on. All right, if you zoom back out, uh, we're part of where I think um, we're getting to why this is becoming so contentious is through the 90s and the 2000s, you certainly heard a lot about the for-profit sector. Online education was a growing case and a lot of people talked about it. And you certainly heard about University of Central Florida, Penn State, the, you know, the ones that I've already mentioned several examples that had long time done online programs. But it was not that well known, this other case of nonprofit schools using OPM providers to actually do a program. And they were not managed centrally. These relationships really, um, one have been characterized as deans gone wild. It was a it was a era where individual deans at academic units they made up their own decisions, and there was no real central coordinating coordination from the central school or university on contracting or anything. Um, and so we had an era where you really had a lot of that happening. 
Well, now it's getting to online education is becoming core to the mission of so many universities and it's changed the dynamic. So if you go to the next zoom in, the way I liken it is through the 2000s, through 2010 or 11, nonprofit online education programs, these were the kids playing in the corner. Uh, faculty groups in particular, they might not have liked it, but they said, okay, that, that's continuing education or that's just the MBA program. It's very isolated. I don't know who those kids are, but as long as I keep playing in the corner, they're not bothering us. The whole market has changed and the online is strategically important to most schools now. It doesn't mean they have to do it, but they need to know what they're doing or not. So these kids are no longer playing in the corner. Now they've moved throughout the whole house and they're causing a lot of chaos. And so there's sort of a shock to the system that's going on that now we do need to address what does it mean for a nonprofit school to do an online program that needs to be run differently than how we've done face-to-face -face for all these years. We're targeting non-traditional students. We need to do 24 by seven support. Uh, quite often there's team teaching instead of just individual faculty designing courses. There's just a lot of questions that get raised by this and it's not easy to deal with. And because it's becoming so pervasive, you have another challenge um, for the next slide. And that is traditionally you've had sort of these ed tech enthusiasts, the innovators, early adopters who are trying stuff and they want to go out and I'll figure something out and I'll put it together. But then you have sort of technology adoption curve points to mainstream people who are much more conservative. Okay, I'll do this, but it better work. And I, you know, I don't have much time, but we need to get, don't make this too hard on me. The challenge we have is that schools need to support both types now. You have these people who used to be the kids playing in the corner, but now they're pushing other areas, but you're getting involvement with more mainstream of the school. And how do you deal with this? The chasm is just pointing out they're very different group dynamics and it's very difficult to deal with them. So this is part of the reason I think we have so much media noise and so much chaos going on. Some of it's because it's a crowded market. Some of it's because it's an expensive, difficult market, but some of it's because we're dealing with very important questions about the academic mission, the role of the faculty, the cost to students for education. Um, a whole bunch of issues are getting raised and we need to deal with them or need to get them re resolved. So that's part of the reason things are so chaotic now. Um, so let me, uh, uh, go to one more slide and then we'll do it more of an open question because I believe we have quite a few questions or I hope we do. Yes, Other, we do. Uh, we'll have a little, we would have an awkward uh, silence going on. No, there's uh, no awkward and, silence happening. We have a lot well, of questions. It might be awkward anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, so one thing is we're moving away from a world of deans gone wild to a more coordinated institutional approach. I'm seeing more and more often where a university, for example, is saying, okay, we need to get control over these OPM contracts. We can't just leave it to individual colleges. We need to have common standards. And I'm seeing that more and more. So the era of where the decisions are getting made and how they're getting coordinated is really changing. The online, I go back to this point, the online market itself is crowded. Competition for students, even among schools, regardless of whether they use an OPM or not. The nature of online, you don't just have a handful of OPM, I mean, uh, online MBAs. You have, you know, hundreds of them out there. You're getting into very localized competition areas. What are the schools in a 150 mile radius that also have an online program in this area. That's my competition. And it's a different view than it used to be even several years ago. Now, there is an increased focus on oversight and transparency through regulation. Now, that could be considered an oxymoron. You don't always get that out of regulation, but certainly there's a focus on we've got to have oversight. We need more transparency of who's making money and how, what's being provided, what are the contractual terms. So we got to deal with these questions that are getting raised, both at state, state legislatures, the federal government is debating some of these issues, 
but it's also being debated in public policy circles. And that's going to continue, that there's an increased focus on that and expect that moving forward. And that will hit not just OPM companies, but schools. There is going to be an increased focus on econ economics. And part of what that means is uh, there certainly is, seems to be a mega trend where no longer are master's programs the sweet spot for online simply cash cows for the rest of the school. There's starting to be an increased focus on, hey, this program costs too much. What's the student debt for this master's online program? And how can you make it more affordable? And there's gonna be increased focus on the institution. I, I'm seeing schools now are saying, okay, I'm very open to revenue share, but how much am I spending for that investment money that I'm getting coming in? You know, am I effectively, you know, what am I paying in interest is one way they're starting to look at it. So this focus on economics, both for student cost, but for also for the institution to have a more mature understanding of the economics, that's going to keep increasing in, in the future. And then the final one, I see it happening, but I'm admitting that this is somewhat aspirational, that this is a key one I hope happens is we need to focus much more in this area on engaging course design and support. So basically academic quality is becoming more and more central to the potential success of online programs and OPM relationships. Not just can you recruit students and get them in the door, but what is the quality of the education being provided and how do we improve it? So it's always been there, but I see and I hope that this area is really going to be ramping up in the future and a key issue to address moving forward. But with that in mind, I wanted to leave some good time for some questions, as many as we can handle within the hour. So I'll turn it to Megan, fire away. Great, thanks, Phil. So we have 22 questions plus a few in the chat, and we certainly won't get to all of those, but I'm just going to go through what I can, and hopefully we can wrap up at the top of the hour. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, if we can't get to everyone's questions, we'll certainly include these in a follow-up blog, so stay tuned. Um, yes. Arthur had a question that piggybacks on Kelvin's previous question. What's your take on why grad programs, over undergrad programs, is it the electives and or core requirements? Um, that's part of it. I, I... I think one of the most obvious ones is that once you're getting into master's programs, students by definition almost are more focused on what they need to get and why they need to get it. You don't have the problem where, hey, I'm going into an undergrad program. What are you trying to get out of it? I, I'm not quite sure. I'm trying to find myself or I just came out of high school. Students in the master's level tend to be much more career oriented on a, a need to get master's in this field for a teaching credential or for a social work credential. So there's a much more focus on why they're in school and what they need out of it. And they typically have more of a uh, time management perspective. You know, I've matured enough that I can control my time because that's important for online education. So I think that's actually one of the biggest reasons they're very different. And one other I would call out is you don't have as many tuition strings attached to nonprofit public colleges and universities at the master's level that you do at the undergrad. There's a lot more leeway on charging more money at the mas for master's programs than you can do for undergraduate. So if I listed, those would be three of them, the one that um, Arthur mentioned and the two that I added to it. Great, thank you. And this um, sort of reminds me of what I was witnessing with the whistleblower discussion earlier today, but <laughs> Josh Kim yeah. has a question about, can you imagine a scenario where OPM critics, like Kevin Carey, analysts, scholars, company leaders, and schools all come together for a collegial discussion? <laughs> Um, I'd rather pay to see the opposite. Now, more seriously, um, I, I don't, let's take out the end of, well, today on Twitter, there was an interesting conversation that was going on uh, that was triggered, as a matter of fact, from a share from Josh Kim's article that I shared, and then the conversation went on. But uh, we had uh, somebody from Noodle and somebody from 2U who were debating about 
the transparency initiative where to you is sort of proactively saying, here's how we're going to be transparent. We're going to release this data to sort of say what we're doing. And we call on other providers to do the same. To you, I mean, Noodle and other providers are skeptical, if you will. And there started to be a debate there about it. But there was a great comment about, boy, that's that would be, I think Trace Erden said, that would be a great way to de-escalate this conversation. Let's get these two people debating things in a productive way in public. So if I think uh, crit certain critics and certain competing views at certain levels, yes, I think we can have more productive conversations. However, I think there's a deliberate, just like the whistleblower issue today, there are deliberate intentions from both sides or different sides to not resolve these issues in a very uh, you know, friendly manner. So I don't think you're gonna get rid of the noise, but I think that it is possible to get very productive conversations dealing with the issues from different sides, but that won't get rid of the big criticisms and debates that are going on in public. So you have to tolerate both is the best case. Right. That's the nature of competition. And yep. here's a question from Laura Pasquini. Hi, Laura. Do you see the expansion of OPM slash OPEs market being driven by the lack of institutional support and structures versus demand and competition for online learning programs? That's part one. Then can universities find the resources they need internally, or will this be the trend of the future to rely on external providers? Oi, oi. Um, it's well, one thing to be careful of, it's a great question, but it's not just the amount of resources. What's really important to understand is a lot of this market has come into place and is still here, not just because, well, how many resources will a school throw at this that they don't have enough? It also gets into, are you willing to operate differently? You're, when you're looking at online students, tend to be non-traditional students, mm -hmm. It tends, you look at a marketing department for a traditional school, they, their methods, their uh, willingness to uh, reach out to students very quickly after they have a request coming in is quite often limited. And it's not just a matter of resources. It's an organizational design and a willingness to do things differently. That, I think, is the bigger reason why this happens, is schools being willing or capable of operating a different way as well as the amount of resources. So I'm not sure if I full, fully answer a question, but I, I think that's driving the market and I think that will continue. I don't think we're getting a broad-based, all non-traditional, all non-profit schools will be, operate differently. I think we're always gonna have this challenge and therefore you're always gonna have somewhat of a need for this market. I don't think that, that need is going away is my gut feel. I didn't fully answer you, but at least tried to. Great. Here's a question from David Stone. What have you seen in the way of intellectual property ownership components as part of the OPM agreements? Early on, I heard a lot of concerns about the ownership of content when partnerships were new. Is the ownership of content IP still an issue or a factor? It's less of an issue right now. I think that the, particularly because we're moving away from, you know, what we described as Dean's Gone Wild, you used to have poor contracts that really didn't clarify who owned what. There were some big assumptions in place about the vendor maybe owning it. Today, you see what I believe are much more mature contracts that call that out. And typically, it's pretty clear that the IP belongs to the school. I wouldn't say in every case, but I'd say in the majority of cases that, that we've seen, the IP is much more clear. So I wouldn't say it's a non-issue, but I would say that it's a, that's an area that I think has improved quite a bit. Now, it raises this digital question of, wait, what is the content? Is it the course materials? What about the Q&A? What about the analytics looking at the engagement of that material whose is that right. so that it's opened up some fuzzy areas but overall i think that's improved quite a bit but it's not fully resolved okay well that just has me thinking about students and data and ownership and all sorts of other fun things yeah well so. yeah that question is not <laughs> just applicable to the opm world right right and another question from Josh, and I'm just going in terms of 
upvotes. So it's not that I'm playing any preference here. But Phil, what ideas might you have to bring OPM's providers and schools to the table to build the infrastructure for independent, data-driven research on outcomes related to nonprofit slash for-profit partnerships in the online ed? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, that's a great question. My, my gut feel is that you're going to have to have an ecumenical organization. Hey, maybe uh, a yeah. WCET. You're going to have to have an ecumenical organization that can strongly facilitate that work to make that happen. It's not just going to happen by a consortium of schools or a couple of vendors finally get together and, you know, kumbaya and start working together. Mm -hmm. I think for that to happen, because I think where Josh is going, and I've read your articles, is you want to get to not just how do you use a vendor, but how does the whole field improve in their knowledge base? So I think there's going to have to be some independent ecumenical organization that gets the buy-in and will strongly facilitate those meetings and discussions. I'm not sure who that's going to be, but I will mm -hmm. add one other point. When you mention data, let's remember the data is really poor across educational technology. Uh, we have lots of data and lots of click streams, but very few cases where it's meaningful, usable data to improve education. So part of what it will take to get to what Josh is asking about is time so that we can figure out how to actually have usable data to feed into this process in the first place, because we're not there yet. Wow, well, I think we have time for one, maybe two questions. Another question from, actually, I'm gonna skip down to Paul here. Are there examples of in-house provisions that have fallen short of initial expectations? Have you looked at California's <laughs> Callbright initiative? and expectations compared to other state-driven online initiatives. And that might be a little too early in its infancy, but if you could speak to examples of in-house provisions. I will wisely choose not to talk about Calbright right now, um, partially based on some consulting work that we're doing. Um, there are lots of examples, and maybe we'll pull this out in the blog post afterwards, but absolutely there's a lot of cases where schools try to do in-house provisions and it just doesn't work. It cannot meet expect expectations. And quite, quite often, the current, the reason I separated creating an online program and delivering for what the market is about is we're seeing more often the case now where a school might say, hey, we've been running this internally, but we recognize we're not doing a good job. Can we, even though we've already started it, can we get somebody to come in and help and run it better? So there are lots of cases I, um, but what I'd like to do is be able to address that in the blog post also so I can get permission if I give specific examples. Um, so let me try to defer that question to the, we'll come up with a blog post that will address additional questions and I'll try to address that there with more specificity. Terrific. And there was a question about if, and feel free to follow up in the blog, but if there are examples of two years using OPM providers. So quickly, I just there, want to make- There are examples on that, but it's certainly not as common, but that, that, that's something we will address. So good question. Great, thank you. So Phil has a great blog. I'll send the link out in addition to the recording. Hopefully I can get that back to you all today. And Phil will be at our annual meeting and we're gonna have an open discussion very much on the same topic. So we'll be able to get to some of your questions. And I really do wanna pursue developing some model agreements for our community. So stay tuned for work on that. But if you haven't registered yet, be sure to register and join us in Denver. And all of our webcasts are recorded and posted on our webcast page, as well as our YouTube channel. So you can always go back and view our previous recordings. And I just wanna make a shout out to, first of all, Phil and all of the wonderful participants that were so engaged today and asked wonderful questions. And our work here at WCET happens because of our members and our sponsors. So our supporting members there, Colorado State University, Michigan State, and Mizzou Online. And then we have wonderful sponsors here that help underwrite much of our programs and events. So thank you to everybody that helps make our good work happen and stay involved. Uh, we don't have any webcasts published yet, but we do several throughout the school year, so stay tuned. Any final comments, Phil? 
Uh, no, other than, uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to being able to capture, uh, look at some of the chat and the Q&A in our follow-up web post. And for those of you who are in Denver, that uh, definitely would like to talk more in person about this question during the WCET conference. But uh, thank you for great questions. I wish more sessions had this type of interactivity and great questions coming in. So thank you. Great. Thank you. You all enjoy your day. Bye, Phil. Thanks. Good luck. Bye.